like half of you had logged into Wiley Plus, which is great. Um, don't wait to do the readings and look at the homework. Get on that right away and keep up because we're building on everything we do. It, uh, somebody asked uh, on Tuesday if it was possible to get a print copy of the book. And the answer is um, yes, actually. The bookstore has a, some sort of upgrade program that they arranged with Wiley where for some additional fee they will sell you a, a loose leaf binder print copy of the book. Um, you need to talk to the bookstore. Okay, but, but there, is, there is in fact. Um, someone else, Elisa, reported that you can rent a hardcover textbook from Amazon for $27 for the semester too, so that's another option. So, <coughs> as I said, I actually really like the ebook, but your experience may differ. <coughs> okay, so last time we talked about <coughs> vectors, <coughs> which represent quantities that have magnitude and direction. <coughs> and today we're going to see one of the things they're good for. So let's consider the following situation. You travel at a speed of 10 meters per second for 10 seconds. Now either you're on a bicycle or in a car or else you're a world-class sprinter because that's about what a world-class sprinter could do. So after that 10 seconds, how far away are you from where you started? Hundred meters? You've been doing this problem since fourth grade, right? So, hundred meters? <coughs> what if I said it was zero? Okay, you'd think I was crazy, but suppose you did this. Now that wasn't ten meters a second, but <coughs> but <coughs> Suppose you started here, and you traveled for 10 meters a second, and you got back there. How far away f would you be from where you started? Zero. And it could be anything in between 10 and zero, couldn't it? Because you <coughs> if you travel in a straight line for 10 meters, you're certainly 100 meters away from where you started, but you could do <coughs> some other things. <coughs> So the problem is that this quantity, <coughs> which is your speed, doesn't give us enough information. <coughs> so the 100 meters is how far you, you traveled, but it's not necessarily how far away you are from where you started. It's not necessarily your displacement. <coughs> and so <coughs> we need more information than just the magnitude of this quantity, we need its direction. So we need to consider velocity as a vector. <coughs> and <coughs> so <coughs> is a vector. Um, and it's going to have three components, x, y, <coughs> and Z. And so I was pretty careful to ask the question, how far away were you from where you started? So the physics term for that is your displacement. And the idea is that if you start, here's the origin, if you start at some location, some initial location, and you end up at some final location, <coughs> this vector here is called your displacement. <coughs> and our mathematical notation for this is usually this. If we say <coughs> the vector from the origin to your initial location is r initial, 
and the vector from your from the origin to your final location <coughs> is r final then the displacement in terms of r initial and r final what is this vector here Say it again. R F minus R. Yes. It's R final <coughs> minus R initial. It's <coughs> and we often use uh, the symbol delta, the Greek uppercase delta, to denote a change in something. So we often write this as <coughs> the change in your position R, delta R. <coughs> Um, so it looks like delta R is R final minus R initial. Um, and however long it took you, you were here at some time T initial, and you got there at some time T final. So the elapsed time we call is going to be, of course, T final minus T initial. And we can call that delta T. And we can now define an average velocity is equal to our final minus our initial over t final minus t initial or change in r over change in t. So in this case, where you actually traveled in a circle, According to this definition, what would your average velocity have been? The vector zero, zero, zero. So <coughs> sometimes we write this as a shorthand is zero with a vector symbol over it, meaning the vector who, all of whose components are, are zero. <coughs> So that isn't necessarily um, the the average isn't necessarily the most useful quantity um, in all circumstances because if you want to know something like <coughs> what was your velocity when you were here. That's kind of an issue. So it's most useful for small times. And in fact, um, it's most useful if, if, if your velocity doesn't change very much during the time that you've been, that you've been moving. Now, did your velocity change, though, when you went around this circle at a constant speed of 10 meters per second? I'm seeing yeses and I'm seeing noes. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> your velocity is a vector. And there aren't any curly vectors. Vectors are straight lines. <coughs> so your velocity, in this case, depends on where you are. <coughs> so let's say you went around this circle clockwise <coughs> instantaneously you're actually heading that direction 
but your direction changes and as you get down here what's the direction of your velocity at this point down <coughs> so your velocity here would have been 10 zero, zero meters per second what would your velocity at this point have been negative. zero negative ten <coughs> so <coughs> So with a vector quantity, there are two ways it can change. Its magnitude can change, or its direction can change. So in this case, we're talking about going around in a circle where the magnitude of the velocity is not changing. You're always going 10 meters a second. But the direction of the velocity is continually changing. We call that velocity at a particular instant, the instantaneous velocity. <coughs> <coughs> and presumably <coughs> it's fairly clear that in, that instantaneous velocity <coughs> is just the limit <coughs> as delta t goes to zero of <coughs> delta r over delta t <coughs> So how does that how does that play out in this circular case? <coughs> Let's draw it bigger. So if we consider the time interval, let's put the origin at the center of the circle to make our lives simple. If we consider the time interval between when you started and when you got to here, here's our initial there's our final. So how do I draw delta R? there or do I start there and go there? Point in the direction of delta R. <coughs> this way, right? Okay, so it starts at initial, goes to final, this is R final minus R initial, this is delta R. <coughs> and what does the direction of delta R tell us about the direction of the average velocity? How is the direction of delta R related to the direction of the average velocity? <coughs> combination of the two vectors of RI and RF. It is. What I'm getting at is this. We know that we have a definition that V average is delta R over delta T. <coughs> so this side's a vector that side's a vector. <coughs> what do we know about two vectors? What's true about their directions? They have to be the same, don't they? Um, and we know that delta t is a positive scalar. We're going forward in time. We haven't figured out how to travel backwards in time yet, so in this course we're always going to go forwards in time. And so <coughs> Basically, we have this vector here <coughs> multiplied by 1 over a positive scalar. So the average du direction of the velocity and the direction of delta r are exactly the same. <coughs> okay, so when you see a vector equation like that, you should think, <coughs> if I know the direction of this, then I know the direction of that. So that means that the direction of the average velocity <coughs> is <coughs> that. <coughs> That's not very close to what we said the instantaneous velocity would be there. <coughs> but maybe we could make it closer by just taking a smaller time interval. So let's, let's consider 
we'll call this what we're going to consider the initial point. We'll call it R2. <coughs> and now, our final minus, if we consider this time interval, which is a to t, we're going to get a delta R that points that way. So the instantaneous velocity we calculate from that time interval is actually going to be in that direction. And that's a little better. And you can see that as delta t and these points get closer and closer together, the average velocity gets closer to the instantaneous velocity. And so it becomes a useful approximation to work with. <coughs> Another thing that <coughs> emerges from this thinking about this situation is that the instantaneous velocity is always tangent to the path you're tracing out. <coughs> OK, so if you're down here, your instantaneous velocity is in that direction. If you're up going this way, this way. <coughs> and so the average velocity may or may not be a, a perfect, a good approximation to your instantaneous. Now when is the average velocity exactly equal to your instantaneous velocity? Yeah. And what does that mean in terms of velocity? Like you're not up yes, well, it's not speeding up, it's not slowing down, and it's not changing direction, right? So if, if the case of the instantaneous, so if your velocity is some constant, then it's always going to be the case that that the instantaneous velocity and the average velocity are the same. They're in the same direction. Uh, but velocity is constant means you have to be traveling in a straight line at constant speed, right? So what is speed, anyway, in terms of this vector v, v average? It is the magnitude. You're absolutely right. So. The magnitude <coughs> is the speed, and it's a scalar. Um, and sometimes, just because it's a lot of drawing to write the vector and the absolute value symbol for magnitude, sometimes we use a shorthand and we just write <coughs> a v without an arrow at all. And that, if it doesn't have an arrow, it's a scalar. And so that often means it's the magnitude of a vector. For a while, we're going to be a little bit compulsive about actually writing out magnitude of vectors carefully using the full notation just to make sure we're, <coughs> we're thinking about, <coughs> about that. <coughs> OK, so what can you do? with average velocity? What good is it? Well, it lets you predict the future. And that's what we're interested in, in physics, is predicting what's going to happen in the future. Sometimes we want to explain what happened in the past, but we want to predict what's going to happen in the future. How does that work? Well, <coughs> if we rearrange our equation for v average <coughs> is r final minus r initial over delta t. Delta t is a positive scalar. We can multiply by it. <coughs> we rearrange this equation algebraically. We get the following rearrangement. r final is equal to our initial plus <coughs> the average velocity times the elapsed time. <coughs> we
we're going to call, this is a very important equation because if we know where we're starting and we know the good average, we have a good idea of what the average velocity of some object is, then we pr can predict into the future where it's going to be sometime later. Uh, now it gets more interesting when the average velocity is changing, when the velocity is changing, because then we have to do a little more work to use this, but this is still basically the heart of what's going to be happening, <coughs> what we're going to be dealing with in this class is predicting the future, predicting motion of objects uh, <coughs> by using their average velocity to update their position. So I'm going to write this up here. <coughs> this is called the, <coughs> we're going to refer to this as the position update equation. And it's one of the equations that we'll use over and over and over and over again in this course. So you should know it. <coughs> so let's see what we can do with this. <coughs> so we're going to consider a problem where we have two spiders ends of a twig. Now, being physicists, we're going to model spiders as little point particles, little spheres, because all we care about is <coughs> where the spider is, how fast it's moving. We don't care whether it's got eight legs or it's got one leg in a bandage or it's, okay, so, so we're going to approximate, we're going to model our spider as just a point. <coughs> and it's, they're sitting on a twig above the ground. <coughs> And the twig is three meters above the ground. And the location of spider one initially is minus 0.5 uh, three zero meters. We're taking an origin here, actually. <coughs> And the location of spider 2 initially is 0, 0,30 0 meters. <coughs> so what we're going to do is use to model the motion of these spiders. <coughs> so the first spider, well, we, to model motion, we know the initial position this, so that we know our initial for each spider, but we need to know their velocities before we can actually make any predictions about what's going to happen. <coughs> so the velocity of spider one, they're both going down previously woven strands of web um, so they can go at constant speed. So the velocity of spider one is <coughs> It's going to go straight down. So the x component of its velocity is zero, right? <coughs> and it's going in the negative y direction, so the y component is going to be negative. So it's minus 0.01, and it's not moving in the z direction meters per second. <coughs> and the velocity of spider 2 is a little different <coughs> because <coughs> Spider 1 is traveling down a strand of web that looks like this, but Spider 2 has a strand of web that looks like that. <coughs> so its velocity <coughs> is going to be <coughs> um, slightly different, <coughs> and we'll come to that in a minute. <coughs> So the first thing we can do, just to practice using this position update equation, <coughs> is to say,
Or will spider one be after 20 seconds? <clears throat> so what's the location of spider one after 20 seconds? <clears throat> So take a minute and think about how you're going to solve that problem. We want the 3D location of spider one after 20 seconds. <coughs> so take a minute. So how are we going to calculate it? We're going to use the position update equation. <coughs> so our final is our initial plus V average <coughs> delta T. So our final is minus 0 0.530 meters plus <coughs> Zero, negative, zero point, what did I say, zero one, zero meters per second times 20 seconds. <coughs> this comes out to um, minus point two <coughs> meters. <coughs> So we have <coughs> and we get negative 0 0.5, 2.80 meters. OK, nothing to it. <coughs> so how long will it teach, take Spider-1 to reach the ground? Okay, so we still have the same equation. We have our final is our initial plus V average <coughs> delta T. Uh, where's our unknown in this equation? What's the unknown? So, <coughs> do we know the initial position? Do we know the final position? We do. We know the average velocity, so delta T must be our unknown. <coughs> so we can write this as our final minus our initial. Uh, equals V average delta T. <coughs> and then it's extremely tempting to do this. But we can't do that because we can't divide by a vector. So that's not a defined operation. <coughs> what we have to do in this case is remember that this is really three, a very compact way of writing three equations. So this equation really looks like Rx final is Rx initial plus V average X delta T R Y final is R Y initial plus V average Y delta T 
and RZ final is RZ initial plus V average Z delta T. <coughs> Now, which of these equations is going to be useful here? R1. Yeah, because R sub x isn't changing. So it's this equation we want. So we can write R y initial divided by V average y is delta t. <coughs> so this is, we, have, we end up at zero meters, right? We're on the ground. So it's zero minus three meters. And we're traveling at minus 0 0.01 meters per second. And that looks good because meters divided by meters per second is going to come out to seconds. <coughs> And so we predict that it's going to take 300 seconds. And then negative signs cancel, so it's a positive number, so we're good, right? <coughs> OK, so questions about that? OK. So now let's consider spider 2. Spider 2 is doing something different because it's going in the plus x direction at a speed of 0 0.007, I think, meters per second. <coughs> and 0 point, minus 0 0.01 meters per second. <coughs> so which spider is going faster? Are they going the same speed? So which, which one's going faster? Two, because the magnitude of this vector is going to be greater than... <coughs> um, so which spider gets to the ground first? Well, that's interesting. <coughs> so which spider gets to the ground first? <coughs> In order to, so we're going to solve this problem two ways. <coughs> And we also want to know how far apart the spiders are when they reach the ground. <coughs> First we're going to write a computational model to do this. And then we're going to come back and solve it algebraically. <coughs> so we write the computational model, I want to show you something about how these computational models work. Um, so this is, I'm at glowscript.org and you can come here and find this. There's also a link, there's a link to this in the introduction, welcome to vPython introduction that you <coughs> are assigned to do. And I urge you, even though we're going to go, th go through this a little bit here in class, I urge you to actually take time to go through it yourself. Because <coughs> so here we have, what do we got here and what is the point of this? <coughs> this, is a, this is a computer program written in Python. And it says A equals 5, A equals A plus 3, B equals 10. Here's a list of things to do. And what this program does is illustrate how the computer's doing this. And understanding how the computer's doing this 
is actually very useful in understanding the meaning of the code that we write to model system. <coughs> so <coughs> what, we're, what this program lets you do is step through, let's see if I can make this just a tiny bit bigger, yeah. <coughs> So the big box on the top represents what's called the CPU, the computer processing unit. That's where the crank gets turned and things get calculated. And the box on the bottom represents the memory that the computer has and different locations in the memory. <coughs> and as we go through this, the first thing we're going to do is look at the first line of the program, which says A equals 5. <coughs> well, what does the CPU do? <coughs> It says, well, I'm supposed to assign the name A to the value 5. So what I'm going to do is pick a slot in memory. I'm going to put a 5 in there, and I'm going to associate the name A with it, kind of like this. So 5 gets read into the memory in the CPU. It gets stored in memory, and now there's a label A that says, if you say A from now on, I'm going to read up whatever's in that slot in memory and use that for A. <coughs> Now the next line is weird. It's A equals A plus 3, and your algebra teacher probably told you that that wasn't a legal equation. And it's not, but when a computer language, what the equal sign mean is not equal to. It means a sign. <coughs> so what it means is, <coughs> read it. <coughs> start with the right-hand side of this equation, figure out what those values are, evaluate this, and then store that into the slot we're telling you. So what it's going to do is it's going to read up the 5 from the computer's memory, add 3, and now overwrite whatever was in slot A. So now it's 8. Okay, now we create a location in memory with the name B and we give it the value 10. The next thing we're going to do is A is A plus B, so it's got to read up the current value of A, read up the current value of B, calculate that, and then store that in A, which is now 18. And now we're going to set B to 1. And we're going to make a new variable named sum. Now, the nice thing about computer languages is you're not restricted to one character variable names. You can call things things that make sense, like spider or sum or velocity or something like that. <coughs> and now what are we going to do? We're going to add up the numbers between 1 and 3. Now, this is not a very exciting thing to do, and you could do that faster than this animation will do it. But the reason it's useful is that if it was the numbers between 1 and a million, this would actually be a better way to do it than doing it by hand. <coughs> so this structure is called a while loop. <coughs> and it says while b is less than 4, and then there's some lines indented underneath it. Indentation means <coughs> that the computer is going to decide as long, if that, if that uh, inequality is true, <coughs> then it will do the lines underneath. And if it's not, it'll, it'll, it won't. It's done. It's going to go on. <coughs> So the first thing it has to do, it's while b is less than 4, is b less than 4. So it looks down here and finds b, which is 1, and says is 1 less than 4, and 1 is definitely less than 4. <coughs> and so it's going to do this next thing, sum is sum plus b. <coughs> and it's asking us to predict what the value of sum is going to be after this line is executed. <coughs> so what's it going to be? It's going to be 1 because we're going to add 0 and 1, so we'll type 1. And <coughs> says, that's right, so we add 0 and 1. And we now store that back in sum, so now it's 1. And then it's going to print it. Printing is extremely useful, because that way you can see the values of what you've got. <coughs> now it says b is b plus 1. We're going to add 1 to b. So again. We pick up B, add 1 to it, store that back in B. And now we have to go back. We're inside this loop, so we have to go back and see if we should still do it again. 
and is 2 less than 4? Yep. <coughs> so we're going to do it again. And so we're going to, what is, that's asking us to predict what the new sum will be after we do this. So what's the new sum going to be? Well, what's the value of B? Yeah, well B is 2, sum is 1, so the new value is going to be 3. Etc. Okay, and we're going to go on. Let's, let's, let's go through it quickly so we can see what happens when finally we're done. <coughs> 2 plus, so we print 2 and 3. We add 1 to B. <coughs> Now B is 3. Is 3 less than 4? Yes. So the new sum is going to be 6. <coughs> and we print B is 3 and the sum is now 6. And we add 1 to B, so B becomes 4. <coughs> and now, finally, when we get to this test, is 4 less than 4? No. So therefore, we're done with that loop, and we go to the last statement, which is <coughs> print sum. OK? <coughs> so basically, that's what's going on in all of the um, in all of the programs that you'll be working with and writing. <coughs> so we're going to write a new program. <coughs> Call it spiders. <coughs> Make it a little bigger here. <coughs> and what we want to do is model the motion of these spiders. <coughs> So the first thing we're going to do is make a twig. It's going to be represented by a cylinder, which is a graphics primitive. The cylinder has a position at its end instead of its beginning. Um, so its position is a vector. I'm just going to say vec for short. Minus 0 0.530. Uh, and it acts as a vector going from the, the position to the other end. And that's a vector uh, 0 0.500, uh, <coughs> and it needs a radius of 0 0.5. <coughs> and so if we run this program, whoops, that doesn't look right at all. What did I do? Ah, we're not going up. The displacement is only along the x direction. <coughs> And the radius is too big. There. There's our twig. OK, and now we'll make the ground. It's a box. Its position is 0, 0, 0. Its length is 7 meters, its height is 0.02 meters, and its width is 3 meters, and let's make it green. Uh, and now we've got the ground. And now we need spiders, so spider one is going to be a sphere. <coughs> and it's at one end of the twig. <coughs> and its color, let's make it magenta. It's a radioactive spider, clearly. <coughs> and its radius is 10 centimeters, which is 
big for a spider, but we need to see it. <coughs> and, <coughs> yep, so there's the spider. And now velocity of the spider, we'll call it V1 is a vector, <coughs> 0 minus 0 0.01, 0, <coughs> 0 <coughs> meters per second. We'll use a delta T of one second, and we'll set T to zero. <coughs> oh, need a zero. <coughs> so you see that when you're doing this, you should run your program fairly often just to make sure that you haven't typed something crazy because it's easy to find errors. And now we get to do the motion. <coughs> So that's cool. So we're going to write one of these while loops. We're going to say while <coughs> spider one dot position dot y. So the y component of spider one's position, this dot notation, <coughs> um, is used to talk about attributes of things like objects like their positions and then dot y means the y component of a vector its position is a vector <coughs> is greater than I'm going to say 0 0.0001 and we'll see why in a minute why I'm going to do this <coughs> so we're done. now we're going to use the position update equation <coughs> we're just going to use just put this in so we're going to say spider one dot position is going to be assigned the new value of spider one dot position plus v one times delta t. Now v one is the average velocity because it's not changing. So it's and then and I probably better spell spider correctly. We're going <coughs> to we're going to add to the time. And now let's just print out uh, time. We'll print the string time and then the value of time, which is t. And we'll print the string spider one position and then so in a print statement, if you put something in quotes, it just prints exactly what you typed. And if you don't put it in quotes, it decides it's a variable and it should go find its value and print that. <coughs> Probably going to need to slow this down. We don't need it to go super fast. So we'll say don't do more than 100 of these loops per <coughs> second. And we probably better put a print finished at the end. So we'll know we're done. Okay, so that's our program animating animating the motion of Spider One so far. Let's run it and see what we've got. Okay. So we can make this a little nicer. So it says at 300 seconds, Spider One's position is <coughs> 1.96725 times 10 to the minus 14th in the Y component. <coughs> now, why is it not exactly zero? We predicted 300 seconds; it ought to be exactly zero. It's because, like your calculator. The computer doesn't store these uh, real numbers exactly. We call them floating point numbers in computer jargon. So they're truncated a little bit, and there's a little error that comes in every time you do this. And since we went for 300 seconds taking steps of a, of a, a hundredth of a second, we did a lot of calculations. And there's <coughs> a one second, actually. So we did 300 calculations. There's a teeny bit of error. <coughs> um, so if we tested for it being exactly zero, we would have gone one more step, and then it would have been negative, and we would have said, oh. But there's just a little bit of round off here. <coughs> your calculator does that too. So if you did 300 calculations in a row on your calculator, you'd get exactly the same round off. It's just a finite. 
Now I'm going to make this program just a little prettier by moving the camera so it points in the middle. Uh, zero halfway in between <coughs> okay so that's just a little easier to see that the ground is really the ground and and I also would like this spider to leave a trail so I can see how it's moving and one of the options for leaving a trail is to so we'll say make trail equals true, that's a property of a sphere. And I'm going to say trail type equals points so that it's going to leave little dots. And I don't want it leaving 300 dots, so I'm going to actually say interval is 10. And now it should leave a dot every time it does 10 of these calculations through the loop. So we see that <coughs> kind of hard to see, isn't it? It'd be better with a white background. Let's try a white background. <coughs> That's a little better. Okay, well we haven't actually learned anything we didn't already know, but now we get to do Spider 2. <coughs> and Spider 2 is going to be more interesting because spider 2 has some velocity, a non-zero x component of its velocity. <coughs> Whoops. There we go. So we'll make a sphere that's to represent spider 2. <coughs> and I can mostly copy this stuff. <coughs> except that its initial x position is zero. And let's not make it magenta. This is clearly a blue spider. Okay, also radioactive, clearly. Um, and this velocity of spider two is gonna be a vector, um, what did I say, 0 0.007 meters per second in the x direction minus 0 0.010 in the y direction. <coughs> and we need to update spider 2 <coughs> position plus, so we're using the position update on spider 2. <coughs> so here's Here's our position update equation for spider 2. <coughs> and probably we should print all that stuff for spider 2 also. So let's So let's say spider 2 spider 2 And I'm just going to put a little pause in here so we have, so we need to click the mouse to actually make it run. So let's see what we've got. We've got spider one, spider two, got the ground. <coughs> so what should happen? Okay, right, so they should So it looked like they hit the ground at the same time, but their velocities were different. So how did that happen? Yeah. Yes, the y components of their velocities were exactly the same. And so the motion in the y direction was exactly at the same rate. And the fact, a very important thing about velocity is that motion in the y direction is completely independent of motion in the x direction. <coughs> so these three equations, here's, here's the equation for motion in the x direction. That doesn't have any y's in it. Here's the equation for motion in the y direction. In it. Okay, so those components of motion are completely independent. <coughs> 
How far apart are the spiders? Well, we see that their fine positions are, um, let me blow this up a little bit. So if spider one is negative 0 0.5, basically zero in the y direction, zero. Spider two is 2.1, again, basically zero. <coughs> so this is a computer, so we'll tell it to print the, so print. <coughs> um, so let's say uh, <coughs> delta r is spider, Two dot posi position minus spider, <coughs> and we'll print uh, R. We'll also print the magnitude of delta R, which should give us the distance. Okay. So we'll quickly run this again. So the difference between sp so spider two position minus spider one position is two point six meters zero zero, and the magnitude of that is of course two point six. Okay, so it just sort of falls out. The answer to our question just kind of falls out of this. We didn't have to do any work; it just told us how far apart they were when we reached the ground. <coughs> So questions about that. <coughs> okay, so how would we have figured that out without a computer? <coughs> so how would we have figured out <coughs> how far apart the spiders are when they reach the ground without using a computer? We need the final x positions, but how do we know the final x? Yes. Use the x component of v two. So we're going to need yes, we're going to need the x component of v two. So let's see what equation we're going to use. Um, <coughs> So we have, so you're saying x2 final, and that's x2 initial plus v2x times delta t. But notice that we needed to solve for delta t before we could do this. So this was a two-step problem. We couldn't just get it right away. We actually had to first figure out what delta t was and then use delta t in this equation. So 300 seconds. So x2 final is equal to 0 plus <coughs> zero point zero zero seven meters per second times three hundred seconds <coughs> and so that is what does that come out to two point one meters but we're not quite done we have to subtract that's not how far apart they are because the x-coordinate of spider one wasn't zero, right? <coughs> so <coughs> x <coughs> one f minus x two f is two point one meters minus a negative zero point five meters, <coughs> and so that gives us two point six meters. <coughs> so in principle, we could just do this problem analytically. It's not that hard a problem to do. It, it's definitely two steps. 
Where it gets interesting is when the velocity is changing. And so that's what's interesting. Why do velocities change? Well, they change because the system interacts with its surroundings. So something, something happens. And so in those cases, it's going to turn out that sometimes a computational model is really the only tool we've got to solve these problems. <coughs> Notice that it was actually less work computationally because we just we found out the final position of Spider 2 because we were just printing it out and it was easy to calculate, so that was actually kind of an easy thing. <coughs> so comments or questions about this piece? <coughs> Yes. So for like any vector in general, the x component doesn't affect the y component? That's right. They're completely separate. <coughs> yep. And that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind as we go forward and we start talking about interactions and being quantitative about interactions. <coughs> OK, so. <coughs> What would graphs um, of this motion look like? If we were going to plot x versus t, y versus t, v sub x versus t, v sub y versus t, what would that look like? So let's start with, what do we want, y versus t. If this is time, this is y. What does this look like for spider 1? So where does it start? At t equals 0, we're at 3 meters, right? And at t equals 300 seconds, it's reached the ground. And so it must kind of look like that. <coughs> what does it look like for spider two? Exactly the same. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Graph of X versus T. <coughs> so for spider 1, what does the graph of X versus T look like? It's a straight line, because X isn't changing. And where's, where do I draw this straight line? Yeah, negative 0.5. So minus 0 0.5. So, <coughs> so that's for spider 1. <coughs> Spider 2 is more interesting. What does x versus t look like for spider 2? So it started at 0. And we went to about 2.5. So so about a little over 2.5 meters at 300 seconds. And is it a straight line, or is it a curvy line? Straight line, because <coughs> because the x component of <coughs> velocity <coughs> is basically the slope of this this curve, right? The rate of change of position. <coughs> okay, what about <coughs> graphing? What about graphing velocity, components of velocity versus time? So, <coughs> so the, the y component of the velocity of spider 1, what did that look like? Positive or negative? Negative because it was going in the minus y direction, right? So something like that. 
Exactly the same for Spider 2, right? <coughs> the x component of velocity. Okay, <coughs> Spider 1, <laughs> 0. Spider 2. And we'll see in lab, um, maybe not this week, but that this kind of graph can actually be useful in solving problems also. So. Okay. Uh, so let's talk, so do you have questions about this? You can solve problems involving position update and velocity. Good. We'll do that this afternoon. So let's talk about what makes velocity change, which is much more interesting. Constant velocity is, oh yeah, I forgot to pass this around. Please sign. You need to remind me about that. <laughs> um, So, <coughs> you've probably heard of Newton's first law of motion, right? Yeah. And what Newton's first law of motion says, the way <coughs> Newton's, Isaac Newton said it, <coughs> <coughs> was that an object travels in a straight line at constant speed except to the extent that it interacts with something else. So a, uh, a space probe headed out of the solar system <coughs> far from anything, coasting along is going to travel in a straight line at constant speed until it gets close enough to something that interacts with it gravitationally, right? <coughs> what about uh, an object that's just sitting still? <coughs> Yeah, so it's, so a speed of zero, velocity of zero, zero, zero is a legitimate constant velocity, right? So, so if <coughs> v equals zero, 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 that's constant velocity. So nothing's <coughs> interacting. Okay, so let's, um, Let's think about this. <coughs> so there were moving objects <coughs> that left traces like our spiders did, you know, leaving a dot at equal times, okay? <coughs> and uh, so there are four of them and they moved in different ways. Which object can you be certain did not interact with anything. There was no total interaction with other things along its path. <coughs> okay, A, because doesn't change direction, doesn't change speed. Okay, so why not B? Speed's changing. Why not D? Is the speed changing? All those dots are the same distance apart. Direction's changing. So change of direction <coughs> as important as <coughs> um, so so clearly there was some we use the word net a lot 
in physics <coughs> means means total or the sum of everything. <coughs> Clearly, if the the speed of an object changed or its direction changed, if its velocity changed, there was some net non-zero interaction with its surroundings. Now it's pretty clear that this water bottle is actually interacting with a number of things. What are the things that it's interacting with? What's one thing? Gravity. Okay, gravity is not exactly a thing. So we're going to we're going to be really careful about an idea about system and surroundings. So what I mean when I say a system is an object and the surroundings are every other object in the world. So Alpha Centauri and the Andromeda galaxy and whatnot. Um, many of these are approximately zero, so we don't have to worry about them very often. But it's certainly interacting with the Earth, isn't it? <coughs> so why isn't its velocity changing? <coughs> yeah, it's interacting with some other stuff too, isn't it? It's definitely interacting with the table, and in chapter four we'll talk a lot more about the nature of that kind of an interaction and how that arises. <coughs> So the net interaction must be that the Earth is pulling down some amount, the table's pushing up, and, and its, its velocity isn't changing. <coughs> um, <coughs> however, <coughs> so interactions change velocity, but that's not the whole story. <coughs> and I don't, I don't have... Uh, my props here, so we'll have to do a thought experiment here. <coughs> so I want you to take this imaginary tennis ball <laughs> and I want you to throw it to me very gently. Okay. Yes, I did a good job. I probably did a better job of catching this one than I would <laughs> of catching. So I changed, the interaction with me changed the tennis ball's velocity, right? I had to do something, we're going to talk about, it's going to be force, isn't it? I, mean, I had to exert a certain amount of force over a certain time, certain interaction, to change the tennis ball's velocity. <coughs> okay, now I want you to take this imaginary bowling ball, <laughs> and I want you to throw that to me at the same, so I, ca I catch it at, when it's got the same velocity. <coughs> okay, I caught the bowling ball. <coughs> now, the change in the bowling ball's velocity was exactly the same as the change in the tennis ball's velocity. But I had to do a lot more to make that change. So it isn't just velocity. What's the other piece that's important? Mass. Mass. <coughs> and so the thing that <coughs> the thing that is changed by interactions <coughs> Velocity's changed. Velocity, <coughs> mass matters. The bigger the mass, probably the bigger the interaction, right? <coughs> so it's this quantity which we call momentum. <coughs> the product of mass and velocity, so it's a vector. <coughs> that actually is what changes when a system interacts with its surroundings. <coughs> so, even though when I caught the tennis ball and I caught the bowling ball, their change in velocity was the same, the change in their momentum was really different because the bowling ball had so much bigger mass <coughs> and I had to actually exert a much bigger force. I had to interact a lot more with that system to change its, its momentum. <coughs> Now, does anybody know why I wrote a here? <coughs> so, who's seen momentum before? <coughs> okay. So, <coughs> this is the approximate definition of momentum because there's another piece to it <coughs> that we only learned about 
fairly recently, like in <coughs> the 20th century. <coughs> really, momentum <coughs> of an object is equal to mass times velocity times a factor called gamma. <coughs> what is gamma? <coughs> this is a lowercase Greek gamma, so gamma. <coughs> <coughs> what is gamma? <coughs> it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus the magnitude of the velocity, so the speed, <coughs> divided by the speed of light <laughs> squared. <coughs> so the fraction of the speed of light Okay, so let's see what this, what this comes down to. If the speed is zero, then gamma is one, right? <coughs> what is gamma going to be if the speed is one meter per second? Well, it's going to be one over the square root of one minus one divided by three times ten to the eighth meters per second squared that's a really small number so it's going to be one minus essentially close to so what's one divided by a really big number essentially zero right so when this ratio is very small this number is approximately zero, and gamma is approximately one. And we'll do some calculations next time, but just to see what range it's in. It turns out when things are moving very slowly, relative to the speed of light, which is a very big number, then in fact, we can say gamma is approximately one. It differs from one negligibly. When we start getting up to a significant fraction of the speed of light, half the speed of light, something like that, then gamma is no longer one because this is no longer a small number. And when this number is not small, then one minus that number is like, it could be something like a half, right? And then gamma could be two. So, so we're getting, <coughs> so, so as we go faster and faster, we'll see that this definition but for most of what we're going to be doing, <coughs> we'll actually be using this approximate equation and it'll be fine. <coughs> See you this afternoon. We're going to work with velocity and average velocity and, yes, what?